so nice to be here in Charlotte, and I want to thank the museum and the radio station, everybody, for just making me feel welcome here. And I want to just begin with a, a little introduction to the book and then bring Mary on to discuss it in more detail. I opened the book with the sentence that goes something like this. If you have it in front of me, you'll see how accurate I get it, if I have it memorized or not. On December 5th, 1955, a young black man became one of the founding fathers of America. So I want to unpack that for just a second. What does it mean for a young black man in 1955, some almost 200 years after the founding of the country, to become a founding father? Well, I would argue that the founding documents of this country, the Constitution, the Bill of Rights, were empty promises in many respects because they were written by people who owned slaves. And they knowingly did not include those enslaved people, those people of color, when they said that all men were created equal and that were guaranteed certain rights and, and rights to um, representation and, ta and government and equality. So that was a work in progress. And no one came closer in the entire history of America than Martin Luther King to forcing the country to confront that empty promise and attempt to fulfill it. And that night, December 5th, 1955, was the night when I believe Martin Luther King became Martin Luther King. He's speaking at Holt Street Baptist Church in Montgomery, Alabama. Alabama is the former home of the Confederacy, the capital of the Confederacy, the capital of Alabama's slave trade, a place where 360 people had been lynched since Reconstruction. And for a 26-year-old black man to stand up in public and to say, we are not going to take it anymore, was knowing that he was putting a target on his back. That day, King was asked not to lead the Montgomery bus boycott, not to become a leader of a movement, just to become a spokesman. And initially, he said no. He wasn't sure he wanted that job. He had just recently turned down an invitation to join the board of the Alabama NAACP. He was new in town. He had a brand new baby. He had a brand new church that he was learning to take care of. And he was not looking for a new career as an activist. But when he was asked, he looked inside, he considered his religious and moral values and felt like he had to go, he had to speak. Why did they choose this kid, this 26-year-old, to be the spokesman that night? Um, Rosa Parks, just two days earlier, as we all know, had refused to give up her seat on the bus. The women of Montgomery, really, had been waiting for this moment for years, planning to protest, planning to refuse to ride the buses. And now the moment had come. They were going to refuse to ride Monday morning. And they didn't know if that was going to be a one-day boycott a one-week boycott, it would end up being more than a one-year boycott. And they were looking for somebody who would try to rally the black people of Montgomery to stay off the buses the next day. And they picked Martin Luther King Jr., frankly, because he was new in town and he hadn't made too many enemies yet, and he had a reputation for being a pretty good speaker. Martin Luther King rushes home, tells his wife, I don't know what I just agreed to, but I gotta make a speech. He had 20 minutes to prepare. He usually liked to have about eight hours to prepare for his Sunday sermons, 20 minutes. Coretta says, well, whatever you agreed to do, I'm, I support it 100%. He rushes back to his little study in the back of their small parsonage, and he has a panic attack. For 10 minutes, he, he's, he's, he's frozen, can't think, can't write. 10 minutes go by, he finally just says, I've got to put my trust in God. And he scribbles some notes, hops in his car, actually Ralph Abernathy picks him up, they drive to the church, he gets to the church, and he sees that they can't even get there because for blocks around, the streets are filled with people. The church has already overflowed. There are thousands of people in the streets. There are people putting up microphone, uh, loudspeakers outside the church so that more people can hear whatever this young preacher who they'd never heard of was about to say. King has to force his way through the crowd to get to the podium. And that day, mostly spontaneously, he says, we are here today to fulfill the promise of the American democracy. We are here today, the, the people who have been most oppressed by this country are going to prove what this country really can be. We are going to prove that the people who have been mistreated are going to show love for the people who have mistreated them and fulfill the promise that America has made and held out in vain for us for all these years. And if we are wrong, the Constitution is wrong. If we are wrong, the Supreme Court of the United States is wrong. If we are wrong, God Almighty is wrong. And that's when Martin Luther King found the voice and the message that would 
inspire this country for the next 13 years. His career was only 13 years. He died 13 years later at the age of 26, uh, 39, I'm sorry. Um, he was supposed to be in Charlotte on the day he died. Uh, but the, but the, um, the workers of Memphis, the sanitation workers, called on him. And once again, he stepped up. And that's what I want to talk about. And that's what I, impresses me most about this book, what about, about Martin Luther King that I was most moved by personally in writing this book, is the way time after time he stepped up to take responsibility, to follow what he believed, what he believed from the Bible primarily, but from also what he believed this country could be. And it's that spirit, that faith, that hope in America that inspired him to take that leadership that day, December 5th, 1955, that inspired him to go on when he was stabbed, when his house was bombed, when he was shot at, when he received death rates, when he learned that his own government was conspiring to destroy him. He stepped forth one more time after another because he believed in what this country could be. So thank you very much. And um, I look forward to continuing the conversation with all of you and with Mary. Welcome, everyone. Well, you have your appetite wet right there. And since I'm a journalist, some news kind of broke recently, and that's that the former president of the United States, Barack Obama, has put out his summer reading list. And guess what's on it? I don't know. Tell me. <laughs> Do you have any reaction to that? That was very cool. <laughs> And now I'm just waiting on Oprah. <laughs> <laughs> Never satisfied. <laughs> In your book, you elevate a quotation from Genesis, and I'm going to read part of it, and at the end I'll come back to the rest. They said to one another, Behold, this dreamer cometh. Why him? Why did King rise as the one the movement rallied behind who became larger than life? Because there were many activists at that time? Yeah, it's such a great question. And it goes back to that moment in Montgomery, really, because there had been protests before. There had been bus boycotts before. There were activists in every community, um, especially in the South. And um, I think King was in the right place at the right time, for sure. That's one part of it. But it's only one part of it. Because I've asked myself this often, and I asked you know, um, Ralph Abernathy's children, if it had been Ralph Abernathy, would the same result have occurred? Um, I don't think it would have. Part of what made King so special, and I mentioned it in my introduction, was that he was combining the Bible and the Constitution, the things that almost all Americans could agree on, and saying these documents, these documents that we all believe in, prove that men are meant to be created equal. Men and women are meant to be created equal. We'll talk later about some of the misogyny in the Civil Rights Movement. but. Um, King had this unbelievable ability to combine these things in a way that just made it seem inevitable. Of course he's right. Even Southern segregationists had to stop and say, wait a second, he's, I do believe in the Bible. I do believe in the Constitution. Uh, where's, the, where's the math go wrong in this equation? And the other thing is that King was unbelievably attractive to the Northern media in a way that I don't think Abernathy, for all his brilliance and his bravery, would have been. Because King was educated in the North, because he was trained in philosophy as well as theology, he became a star. Everybody wanted him on TV, on the radio. The newspaper reporters were knocking down his door. And he presented this, this um, kind of image of the, of the civil rights activists, the marchers in Montgomery, as being followers of, of Christ in a way that was so compelling because they, they were seizing the high moral ground. And King was just the perfect messenger for that story. So um, I think that he was not only in the right place at the right time, but he had this perfect combination. The fact that he was, that he was from the South, that he was from a preacher's family, that he was, um, that, that, that he was in, you know, sort of inheriting this role that his father took, but his father could only take it so far, given the limitations of his generation. King was just perfectly poised to take this, and then once he achieved this kind of celebrity and success in Montgomery, the next question was, how do we repeat this nationally? And people began looking to King to do that. Well, you've talked about faith. Please talk about the role of religion in his life. How did his faith sustain him? 
we know he was afraid. You said his, his home was bombed. Uh, his family, including his children, were in the home. How did faith help him transcend that and the fear? Yeah, I think he felt like he was not an important person in the grand scope of the universe, that God had bigger plans and that he was prepared to play whatever role God had planned for him. And he also f believed that you've got to do what you believe in. You've got to follow your, your faith and, and, and that whatever risk might come from that was worth taking. And, and it goes back to, you know, his family. Um, you know, his father was born um, into sharecropping uh, worked as a sharecropper on a farm in Stockbridge, Georgia, until he was 12. And even though he had received very little schooling, just walked off the farm one day to Atlanta and decided that he was going to find a new life, that this was the only way to escape the cycle of poverty that sharecropping imposed on his family, was to, was to leave for the city. And just as many people left for the north, many others left for the city. And there he got himself an education, talked his way into Morehouse College, convinced people that he was a Baptist preacher, even though he, you know, because he could preach, but he didn't have to have a license necessarily. You know, you, you preach first and get the license later. He created a, a path forward for his son. And in doing that, and this gets back to your question about faith, he, he raised his family with the belief that religion, the, the black social gospel, was different from the white social gospel in that it required you to preach not just to save souls, but to save society, to save the country, that the Bible does not square with segregation, and we have to work that out. That's part of our responsibility as Christians, and that's the way he was raised, and that was just in the water, in the air, in the home he grew up in. Well, I was fascinated by his childhood and seeing him as the young man. How did his childhood shape him his parents, their attitudes toward him, toward the sister and brother. It seems like it had a lot to do with his commitment uh, that came to be the Martin Luther King we know. No question. I mean, the expectations for him were really high. Uh, he was the middle child. His, his, his sister, Christine, uh, was a year older. She just passed away a couple of weeks ago, uh, which reminds us that King could very much still be with us. Um, but they grew up in a family where they were kind of like, you know, royalty in the neighborhood because they lived down the block from their church. It was a big church. Everybody in the community knew them. You know, he, if, he, if he got into trouble, somebody was going to know about it and it was going to get back to his parents. And at the same time, several nights out of the week, it felt like almost every night, he said, there were guests at the dinner table, you know, visiting preachers, um, neighbors, and um, he was living very publicly. He was also living fairly um, comfortably. For a child, uh, for a black child uh, during the Great Depression, they never wanted for food. Um, they, they always had a car, they had a housekeeper, and um, they had pets. You know, it was a yeah, fairly comfortable, you know, middle class um, childhood. In fact, one of King's friends said to me, they felt like Martin was not bruised mm -hmm. in the same way most of them were by racism, that he certainly experienced it. And he talked about it and wrote about it often, but he seemed to have been less wounded by it just because he had this incredible support system around him. He grew up on what many people considered, you know, the, the richest black street in America, um, Auburn Avenue, and that um, he had, you know, the, he had colleges, um, you know, black colleges where he and, and his siblings could could reasonably expect to, to matriculate. So he had a lot of advantages relative to some other people. And didn't that later, he felt throughout his uh, ministry and his career a little bit of guilt because he saw so many black folks who did not have that. Yeah, he often talked about how guilty he felt. You know, he, he, you know, he, he was born in 1929, so he remembered seeing uh, lines for, for food during the Great Depression. And he certainly knew people when he went to college who had it a lot tougher than him, had trouble paying the bills. And he had a car in college. Like, nobody had a... When I talked to girls who dated um, Dr. King, they would say... Two, they would, the first thing, two things they would always say was, he was pretty short, <laughs> but he had a car. <laughs> <laughs> what was the biggest revelation for you about King in writing and researching this book? You spent, what, six years with him? years, yeah. 
what what was the biggest the biggest revelation um while well, there were so many but i think and, and this might sound stupid uh because his, he was reverend martin luther king jr but i was really kind of surprised at just how deep his faith was because you start to think about people like King as almost as political figures at a certain point, and he was often referred to as the black president. But so much of what he did was guided by his faith, and I think when I was younger, I didn't appreciate that enough. And until you really spend the time, not just you know talking to people who knew him, but you know reading his work and thinking about the choices he made in life over and over again, so much of it is guided by faith. Because I think very often, if I were in his position, I would have taken the exit ramp. You know, he had many opportunities to become a university professor or, or, a, or a, a pres university president. He could have left and written books. Um, many times people said to him, you know, you're not as effective as you were before because you're insisting on talking about poverty. You're insisting on talking about northern segregation and it's hurting our movement. If you would just stick to voting registration, voting rights in the South, we would be much more effective. We would raise much more money from our Northern supporters. Um, we would have much more influence in Congress. When he started talking about Vietnam, you're, you're, you're destroying your relationship with President Johnson. And over and over again, K King said, don't you realize that I'm not a politician? I'm not concerned with my popularity. I'm doing this because of what the Bible says. And even his closest friends, couldn't understand it and told him he was wrong, that he was, that he was hurting himself, hurting the movement. And over and over again, he says, I'm a Baptist preacher. That's who I am. I believe in this stuff. I'm not just doing this because it's, because it's, because it's cool or because that's what, I, what people expect from me. This is truly what I believe. And when you, you, know, when you read what I consider his greatest speech, the, um, the Vietnam speech that he gave April 4th, 1967 at the Riverside Church, um, what he's saying over and over again is that we can't pick and choose which parts of the Bible we believe in and which parts we act on. And he felt compelled to act on it. So he's saying, I can't tell people to stop the violence in Los Angeles if I'm not addressing the bigger source of violence, which is the American government's activity in Vietnam. That's hypocritical. And I can't pick and choose which parts of the Bible I'm going to preach on. This is what I believe in. And and that kind of faith that, and that willingness to act on that faith, um, knowing that it's putting you in danger, knowing that it's making your life more difficult, I mean, that's just, I'm still getting, I get goosebumps from that. But he also knew where sometimes as a person of faith, uh, his idea of himself fell short. He was a human being. Could you talk a little bit about that, about his humanity? Yeah, um, I know where you're leading with that, Mary. You want me to get into the dirty stuff, but um, listen. Um, no, it's, it's it's about important. more than that. It's, it's important. It's about and, that, and, and, and it's about other things. I think, no, number, if you ask me what my number one goal for this book was, it was to create a more human portrait of King because we have turned him into a monument. The national holiday, while doing a great deal um, for, for King's legacy and for history has also had the effect of making him feel two-dimensional and watering down his message, watering down his religious faith, watering down his radicalism. And I wanted to write a book that would make him more human. And I think when you see him as somebody who's flawed, who suffers, who has moments of doubt, anxiety, depression, um, and infidelity, marital you know, infidelity, when you see him as a, as a, as a real human being, you res I think you will respect him and, and appreciate his greatness even more. So I felt like that was really important. And, um, and, and King understood that he was flawed and talked about it in his sermons all the time. He didn't obviously get into the specifics, but um, he, he struggled with that, with the guilt for that all his life. And I wasn't just talking about the infidelities. I was struck by how often he was depressed. Yeah. He got anxiety attacks once he almost pretty much collapsed while he was speaking. He would go off and take rests. And even the picture of him in the book, it's a stately picture, but it's melancholy in its own way. Could you talk a little bit about how that would wear on him? Yeah, you know, that's one of those issues that we talk about now a lot more openly than we did in his time, and he couldn't talk about it. Um, he attempted suicide twice as a teenager, um, 
and they they were somewhat half-hearted attempts, but nevertheless um, revealing, and, and he referred to them as suicide attempts. And he was frequently hospitalized. He called it exhaustion. One of the things that, you know, it's one of these things like you don't even notice it until you notice it. But when he got news that he won the Nobel Peace Prize, look at the New York Times, the front page story. There's a picture of him. He's in the hospital. And the reporters, you know, call him at home to get re his response. And Curtis says, well, he's at the hospital. So the reporters go to the hospital. He says he's there for exhaustion. And re um, Coretta referred to it frequently as, as depression. Jesse Jackson told me he thought he was clinically depressed. And some of his friends suggested and had him talk to a doctor about trying um, some medication that might help him feel better. Um, you know, he was under enormous stress and he may have also just been biologically prone to some depression. Um, it seemed to run in the family, some people told me. So I think that, you know, we need to understand just how brave he was to to, to, to deal with all of that and to deal with it fairly publicly. And he had a lot on his shoulders also. Well, obviously. that didn't help, yeah. <laughs> uh, you talk about talking with uh, Ralph Abernathy's children and others. Talk a little bit about some of the interviews you did. You did quite a few, and uh, maybe some that were the ones that most surprised you, that you got some real insights into King from. Yeah, this was one of the great joys and privileges of my life, and it's, it's rare that you realize when you're going in on something that this is going to be you know, one of the great experiences of your life. The idea that I was gonna spend six years traveling the country, interviewing people who knew Martin Luther King, all of them in their 80s and 90s, I just realized that how unbelievably important and um, privileged I was to be able to do that. Um, how unbelievable, I don't mean to say I was important, how unbelievably important it was to do that, to record their stories, and what a privilege it was for me. And um, certain people, as you could imagine, the famous people who've been interviewed a million times, it's tough to get them to really reflect and to say anything new and different. Um, but the people who I think I enjoyed the most were the people who hadn't been interviewed much before and who um, most of you will, would not have heard of, but who knew King in a really intimate, personal way. Um, one of my favorites was June Dobbs, who grew up with King on Auburn Avenue, same age as him, and um, his, his, her sister had dated King and her best friend had been engaged to King. And they used to play together after school, like all through elementary school into high school. And even in college, they had an internship together where they traveled around um, Atlanta interviewing preachers for a professor who was doing like a survey of, of preachers in town. And she would spend all day with him over this, this one summer. And they would you know, sit under a tree and eat their lunch. And June went on to become a sex therapist. So <laughs> she was great. She, <laughs> and she, she knew her best friend was, was engaged to King. And she said that um, she knew so many th things about, the, about the, the whole family. You know, she, her, her father was um, one of the legends of black Atlanta, um, John Wesley Dobbs. And, and, and knew everything. She knew the story of how young ML um, ended up dressing in slave clothes to perform at the opening of Gone with the Wind. Like, let that sink in for a second. The Ebenezer Baptist Choir is dressed in slave togs to perform for an all-white crowd. Black people are not invited to the opening of Gone with the Wind. And all the other black preachers in town said, how can you let your church do this, Reverend King? Um, and June's father, got into it with MLK Sr. saying, this is, this is embarrassing, you can't do this. And Reverend King sent the church anyway, and there's 10-year-old Martin Luther King Jr. dressed as a slave, sitting in the front row of the choir, singing these, these slave hymns. I mean, that's mind-blowing. Um, but June also told me that um, young ML, as she called him, um, said that he was disturbed by the fact that his father was not faithful to his mother and he knew this and that he felt like most of the community knew it and he vowed that he was never going to be that way, that he was going to be loyal. And uh, June just laughed and said he, he was already dating, he was dating three girls at that time that he said that. <laughs> he was human. Uh, uh, you also say that uh, people would be surprised at how radical King was. If you could how are you defining radical, and why do you think that word is a good description for King? 
I think King, in, in you know, one of the other problems with the national holiday is that it has made him into this very safe figure, and we only quote the phrases that we like, and in fact, you'll find a lot of people who would disagree with King on almost everything using quotes from him to justify their, you know, if you, if you're, if, if you are opposed to affirmative action, you say, well, Dr. King said we should be judged by the content of our character. But in fact, he was, he was in some ways, I think more radical than Malcolm X, because he was calling for dramatic, fundamental changes in American society, in American economics. He was calling for reparations. He was calling for guaranteed income, guaranteed jobs. He was calling for s systematic changes to overcome the systematic racism in this country. And he was also doing it in a way that forced us to confront change. It was not just, you know, Malcolm X, to me, is one of the great grassroots leaders of our, in our country's history, but he wasn't really asking for anything specific. He wasn't a change agent. He was a firebrand. Martin Luther King was, was getting his hands dirty, dealing with Congress, dealing with presidents, you know, using his protests as levers to force concrete change, to get more people registered to vote, to get laws off the books that were dividing us. And, and to me, that's more radical. And um, when you look at what's considered his most popular, his most famous speech, I Have a Dream, we quote, I have a dream, and we quote content of our character, but we forget that in the first half of that speech, he called for reparations and he called out police brutality, and he, but the white media didn't, didn't quote that part of the speech. So if we go back and actually read King's own words, as opposed to just picking and choosing the quotes that the, that the white media has chosen for us, you'll see that um, they're radical. Well, even at that time, at his death, he was losing some popularity because, as you say, he was talking about war, poverty, making connections, talking about how many young African-American men were being killed in Vietnam. And when he was killed, I think the polls said that a majority of Americans, about 70 percent, thought disapproved of his tactics, his message, thought he was rather dangerous. And yet, we see that this image of him has been transformed. Even Ronald Reagan, when he signed his holiday, implied he might be a communist. Yeah. How, talk about this transformation into almost this teddy bear. Uh, and why did it happen? And what's the danger in that? Yeah, that's a great question. Um, and I would also point out that even at the March on Washington, 70% of white Americans were opposed to it. So it wasn't just the last few years of his life. And when King began, you know, came to my hometown, Chicago, and moved in on, uh, on the west side and began to call out um, racist landlords and school segregation, um, he was run out of town. He was hit in the head with a rock, and he said that he thought the racists, the white racists of Chicago could teach the white racists of Alabama a thing or two. Um, and that's again, speaks to his courage for coming to Chicago because he could have stayed in the South. But he, he went north and told the people who were funding him that you're just as bad as the people in the South. And, and that took an extraordinary courage. And, it, and he paid a price for it. You know, his popularity fell off. And when he began speaking out on the Vietnam War, his popularity plummeted. By the, as, you, as you said, by the time of his death, 70% of Americans disapproved of his tactics. And that is in part fueled by the FBI's campaign to try to damage his reputation. It's not just that King is radical. It's that our law, top law enforcement officials have been working for years to undermine him. So we haven't talked too much about this yet, but they were tapping his phones, um, bugging his hotel rooms, and they were distributing the information from that, from, those, from that surveillance to members of the media. And even though members of the media didn't report on his sex life, they knew that he was living this secret and that their opinions of him were, were damaged by that and his coverage was affected by that. So when he speaks out on the Vietnam War, the New York Times, the Washington Post, almost every major media outlet in the country says, he has no right to speak out on Vietnam. He's, he's not an expert on international affairs. He's, he's, he's you know, this is, this is wrong. Never mind that he had a Nobel Peace Prize. I think that's qualification, but, um, <laughs> That's in part because the, the media and, and our government were, were attempting to damage him, to destroy him. 
Well, let's talk about King and the FBI. I mean, it was amazing in the book. It was a true obsession. Uh, and you wonder if the FBI had spent as much time protecting him as a civil rights leader rather than spying on him if he might have been safer. But talk about the obsession that they were communist controlled, that it was un-American, and that the movement itself was un-American. And what what was the what happened with that? Because it, it was surprising in the book the extent of it. It was to me too. And in, we've known about the FBI surveillance of King for a long time, but over the last three or four years, more documents have been released, um, declassified. And I discovered hundreds of pages of new material um, that was in LBJ's secretary's safe that nobody had seen before that revealed that LBJ was personally involved in this smear campaign. And, and just to give you a little bit of the background, the Kennedys authorized the wiretaps on King because they were genuinely concerned that he might be under the influence of communists. And they were, it was the Cold War, you know, we were worried that the communists were putting fluoride in our water. There was a significant amount of paranoia. And if they, they thought if, if, if the communists infiltrated the civil rights movement, it might do damage to the country. Okay, that's perhaps a reasonable fear, perhaps. Let's give them the benefit of the doubt. So they begin tapping the phones of King's closest supporters, and then they install taps on King's home and office, and they're listening to all of his phone calls, and it quickly becomes clear that he's not remotely interested in communism. He's actually talking about trying to improve democracy. Okay, so, and, and even J. Edgar Hoover admits that there's no, in, nothing to indicate that King is moving or trying to move the move, movement toward communism. But by that time, they've heard him on the phone with women other than Coretta, and that becomes an obsession for J. Edgar Hoover. And he begins using that to justify the continued surveillance and feeding this gossipy material to the presidents, to members of Congress. And you have to ask yourself, why is that important? And try to, if you can, put yourself into the warped mind of J. Edgar Hoover and think, why is that important? Obviously, his sex life has no meaning to national policy, but it's a lever of control. And J. Edgar Hoover, his job is to maintain the status quo, which means the white power structure, which means I think you could reasonably call him a white Christian nationalist, as Lerone Martin's book, uh, new book makes the case. So if you believe that Martin Luther King has the potential to unify the black community and to fight for change in American society and to reshape the contours of the American democracy, and to make it more representative of the demography of this country, well, yeah, the Martin Luther King is a threat in, in that worldview. And that's how J. Edgar Hoover justifies the continued surveillance. And it becomes so pernicious that the FBI at one point takes a compilation tape from the King's hotel rooms and mails it to his office knowing that it will be routed to Coretta. It includes a letter telling King that this tape is going to become public. And the only way for you to avoid complete shame when this is released is, for you, is to kill yourself. And King knows immediately that this came from the FBI. He knows immediately that his own government is trying to destroy him. In fact, at that point, the FBI was, um, was grooming a successor to King, somebody that they believed they could plant as the new leader of the civil rights movement. Um, and that's what he was up against. And um, when something like the March on Washington took place, and it became clear that King really did have the power to inspire, that people really might want to follow him, that even white people were beginning to think this country could change, that only made him more of a threat to J. Edgar Hoover. Wow. And also he had uh, many of the FBI agents in the South were uh, basically sympathetic to that, and they were involved in some acts of terrorism. Yeah, and King called that out. You know, King said, look, why should we believe the FBI is on our side when there are no black agents in the South? The white agents are all in cahoots with the local police departments, and the local police departments are jailing us and beating us. Why should we believe the FBI is on our side? And that just infuriated J. Edgar Hoover even more because you don't criticize the FBI, and certainly a black man doesn't criticize the FBI. That's just off the... Off. Educated black man. Right, that was a great threat felt uh, threatened by that. When you're talking about the tape, one of the first of the first people that heard it was Coretta, I believe. 
I would like, one thing I really appreciated about the book is we all think of Coretta, the wife, but she was so much more than that. She pushed him. And basically, he did say that he owed so much to her to keep strong. Talk about Coretta Scott King. She was called the miracle. Yeah. Let's talk about that. I really wanted to give Coretta the due, the, the, give her, her, her the treatment she deserves in this book because she's never had a proper biography and the other books have pretty much neglected her role. And I would argue, I would believe, and I talked to Harry Belafonte at, this, at length about this because Belafonte knew her really well, that the reason Martin Luther King married Coretta is because she had more experience as an activist than he did at that point in their lives. Um, you know, as I mentioned earlier, King dated a lot of women, and um, there were a lot of beautiful, intelligent women. Why Coretta? And I asked Belafonte that question. He said, in some ways, it was like a, a business decision. Like, this woman could be a great partner. She has something that very few women have today, because she'd been to Antioch College. Um, she'd been to a... Um, a very progressive high school before that. At Antioch, she'd been involved in protests. Um, she, there was a local barber shop that refused to cut black hair and, and she was picketing. Um, she lobbied the school to allow uh, black students to do their student teaching at white schools. Um, she attended the Progressive Party's National Convention. She had more, way more, at that point when they met on their first date in Boston, um, King had not been involved in any activist movements at all. So he meets Coretta and he's, wow, this, and she's recommending books that he needs to read. So I think that's what really drew, drew, them, drew him to her. And, um, and of course, then the irony is that King is a product of his times. He's a product of the Southern Baptist Church and he's, he's a sexist. And when she says, okay, um, I'll move south with you. I'm not excited about it because I want to be a, she wanted to be a concert singer and she couldn't do that in the south. Um, I'll go with you. And then she says, well, I want to be involved in the boycott I want to be involved in some of these meetings. You know, I can, I can give some speeches um, too. And he says, no, your job is to stay home with the kids. And even, you know, years into their marriage, even into the mid 60s, there's a letter that she wrote to him saying, you know, I could be doing more. We've got people home who can help take care of the kids. I could be doing more. I feel called by God just like you do. And he said, no, your calling is to stay home with the children. That's your role. And she talked about it, and she was frustrated by it, and she, and she put up with it. And over and over, if you read her books, if you listen, I found these tapes that she made. Um, she began working on a memoir right after King's assassination, and um, I think I'm the first um, person to, to actually get the tapes that she made as she was working on that memoir. And she says over and over again, and this too, I accepted. Mm -hmm. But there was steel. There's a scene where he's not even there, and the, she's with a church lady, and the little baby is in the back. And there's a bombing blowing off their porch in the front part of the house. And her father's running from Alabama, saying, I'm going to take my little baby home, my grandbaby home. And she's like, no, I'm here. She's standing on the porch holding the daughter, very calm. Talk about that strength and how she sustained, basically, Martin Luther King Jr. Yeah, I think you can't um, overestimate the bravery that that took because A, she's being relegated to a to secondary role. She might have been bitter about that. She would have been completely rational in saying, we can't put our, our children at risk this way. You know, the, the home had just been blown up. And she was home alone with the baby and, and her father comes and says, you're coming with me, you're moving out, this is too dangerous. And who knows what would have happened if she'd left? You know, maybe Martin Luther King would have reconsidered his position as, uh, as the leader of the movement at that point. But she says, no, we're staying. And that happens over and over again. You know, uh, just a year after the bombing, um, King is stabbed in the chest in Harlem. And once again, you know, it's not just King who's deciding that he's going to continue. Coretta's deciding too. And in some ways, she's doing it without any of the attention, without any of the celebrity and then when she finds out that, you know, Martin's, you know, not being faithful to her, she sticks with him because, not just because she loves him, but because she knows that this, is, this, would, this would damage the movement and that he needs her, the movement needs her. And she does find a way to become more active. You know, after, the, after they win the Nobel, after he wins the Nobel Prize, she says, this means we have a greater responsibility than ever. <laughs> 
and she takes and she takes that seriously. She speaks out on the Vietnam War before he does. Uh -huh. And there were other m women that you elevate in the book, uh, Ella Baker and others, who really ran the movement in many ways. Could you talk a little bit more about that? Yeah, the movement, even as early as Montgomery, it's it's Joanne Robinson and the other women who have organized the community. They have the ability, again, pre-internet, to to go knocking on doors, to hand out flyers, and to get the women to stay off the buses and to attend the rallies. And over and over again, we see when the civil rights movement shifts to voting rights, it's the women who organize the education campaigns so that people can pass the tests to, to register to vote. It's the women who go into the communities and teach literacy. Um, and over and over again, King neglects them as, as potential leaders. Um, Ella Baker is installed temporarily as the executive director of the SCLC and absolutely should have just had the job. Uh, the, the SCLC, that's the Southern Christian Leadership Conference, which is King's organization, never had an effective CEO. They never found a good manager in all of the 13 years of King's career. And that's because they passed on the best one, which is Ella Baker. And, that's, and Ella Baker talked about it all the time. She said, they're Baptist ministers. They are just raised in this sexist environment, and I can't talk any sense into them. I want to talk a little bit about past echoing present. Even for someone whose three elder siblings were involved in the civil rights movement, I had a brother who was arrested twice, and I knew some of this, but to see the examples of the deliberate and really in incredible cruelty, racism, uh, the violence that the folks in North and South really pushed up against when they felt that their systems were being questioned by the civil rights movement. And I mean, all the people who were just killed flat out, you know, shot. Uh, when you were researching it, did it surprise even you? Yeah, it did. And maybe it shouldn't because it's been a part of our history since forever. Um, Any time in American history we've seen progress on race, there's a backlash. You know, slavery ends and Reconstruction begins, and then you get Jim Crow. Um, you know, the Klan rises and falls. Every time that there's progress, um, you get a black president, and then you get, well, we saw what came after that. Um, and but to see it to the in this level of detail, to see the fact that people would go out and buy dynamite and blow up a church because a black man had given an inspiring speech that seemed to be unifying people. And that's what it's about, right? The, the, the sight of black and white people holding hands and singing in harmony on the nation, uh, uh, in the nation's capital was so upsetting and so revolting and, and caused so much fear that we might lose our way of life, we might lose our position, our control over, this, over society that it would inspire somebody to blow up a church and kill little children. That's the level of hatred that we were that we were living with. Maybe we still are living with to some extent. Well, I was going to ask about that. What would King think? What do you think when you see today, with progress, a young man going to Buffalo and shooting folks, black people at a supermarket, a young man going to El Paso and shooting Mexican Americans? Uh, leaders, elected officials who are working to erase the truthful stories about race in our schools. We see just recently uh, in Florida, they're talking about teaching uh, slavery and saying that the enslaved learned useful skills that benefited them. What would you say about it, and what do you think King would say? Yeah, I don't think I have to answer that because King spoke for himself so eloquently. And? And he said that we are a country that has still not come to terms with our history. And that's exactly what's happening in Florida. We are intentionally trying not to come to terms. We, if we don't, it's like, no, 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 I can't hear you. Um, we had you know, 300 plus years of slavery in this country. And as King said, even in this most famous speech, which we don't remember the part where he said, America has written a, has, a, a, has, has defaulted on the promise. Um, it's a check that, that didn't clear. And until we come to terms with it, until we reckon with it, until we, it's, it's the same thing that the Bible says, right? You have to atone for your sins. 
And until you atone for your sins, you can't move on. You're going to continue to be a sinner until you atone for your sins. And that's what King said over and over again. And that's what we're still dealing with. We are, you know, we are just refusing to deal with our history as if ignoring it will make it go away somehow. Well, it doesn't make it go away, but it allows those people to think that maybe they can just preserve the status quo for a little longer. Well, it is interesting going back that in 1964, there was a poll in the New York Times where a lot of folks, white folks said, uh, there was, they used that term white backlash for the first time, that isn't this civil rights thing, we're kind of sick of it. Mike Wallace said, you know, Dr. King, people are so over this, uh, and we see this today. Uh, what did he say about that? What, was, what would he do? K King didn't get angry much, but I think that's what made him the most angry, and in particular, uh, when it came from religious leaders, they would say, and this is what the letter from Birmingham Jail is about. That's probably the only piece of King's writing that we teach in our schools beyond, you know, I have a dream speech. Um, but it's, it's a good one. It's worth teaching. Um, we need to teach more. But that, the whole point of that is that if a bunch of uh, religious leaders, when King was arrested in Birmingham, published a paper, uh, an article in the newspaper, a letter to the editor saying, King, we, we support you. We, we believe in equal rights. We believe in justice for black people, but slow down. You know, don't ask for too much too soon. You're just going to make people mad. You know, all these people who might be your supporters are horrified by your conduct. You know, you're shutting down businesses in Birmingham. You're hurting the economy. You're, you're, you're pushing away potential allies. And King said in that letter, how can you say that? How can you ask us to wait when we've waited so long, when we've been abused for so long, when we are not seeking to overthrow this society, this country, this government that has mistreated us for so long? We are only asking to join it. How can you ask us to wait? And that, I think, infuriated him more than anything else, especially when it came from, from people of faith who are somehow saying, you know, just wait a little longer, you know, the, the, Bible, the Bible's right, but be patient. Another thing that surprised me was you talk a lot about King's uh, dealing with young progressives at the time, where actually some who felt he was going too slow did later come and respect him in their own way. Folks like Stokely Carmichael, uh, when he started to say black power. Could you talk a little bit about that? Because he always not only had the strains of white society saying we're not ready, but there were young black people saying, no, you're moving too slow, and we're not so sure about this nonviolence thing. Yeah, you talk about the stress King was under. So he's not only getting it from the FBI and from, you know, um, certainly from Southern segregationists, um, he's getting it from, from a lot of black people too, and um, as, he matures and as he becomes a leader, well, it's always easy to take shots at the leader. And younger black activists start referring to him sort of derisively as Delord. Like, oh, Delord says that we must do, right? Like, as if he's, um, as if he's uh, you know, he's a grown up and they're the cool kids. And um, King has enormous patience. You know, he throws himself into the things like the, the, the lunch counter sit-ins, um, the, the freedom rides, even Mississippi when, when um, James Meredith you know, sort of lures him down into a situation he doesn't want to be in. Um, King is being mocked by a lot of the younger black protesters for, you know, refusing to, to get on the bus on the Freedom Rides, for, you know, refusing to embrace the idea of black power. You know, the, as the civil rights movement evolves, you start to see the Black Panthers, you start to see Stokely Carmichael saying, enough of this nonviolent turning the other cheek stuff. We, we've turned our cheek enough. You know, it's time to fight back. And they're pushing King to, to, to come along with them. And King, you know, refuses. He refuses to, to, to even use the words black power. But one of the things I love about King and that Stokely Carmichael loved was that King would listen. He would learn from them. He would stick to his beliefs, again, rooted in Christianity. He was never going to be not anything but nonviolent. Um, but he was happy to engage, happy to debate. I think even with Malcolm X, King was moving toward um, a relationship. I think he was open to having a relationship with Malcolm X. And um, to me, that's just, you know, incredible. Uh, it's a great testament to his leadership that he was willing to work with and, and listen to the people who were attacking him at times.
Yeah, and they often find him just in rooms with young people, just chatting and talking with them. All those scenes you set are, are really fascinating. Um, you know, in the beginning I talked about the quote from the Bible, and let me see if I have it, because at the end, of course, we talk about slaying the dreamer. And he now uh, would look at today, and he was a global person, as you said. He got the Nobel Peace Prize. And if you look at the issues that are dealing with around the world, right-wing governments, gaining power, unrest over police brutality in France, uh, all of these immigration concerns, what would he think of what has become of his dreams? And what would he say about the work to be done? Well, once again, King said it, so I don't have to um, try to imagine what someone much smarter than I would have said. Um, the speech that he was planning to give uh, the following Sunday um, after his assassination was called America May Go to Hell. And he felt a sense of deep frustration that his dream had turned into a nightmare. He said that several times, that he had this vision of of a country that was ready to turn the page and put its racist past behind it and that we somehow refused to do that, that we kept going back to our old ways and that he, he felt a sense of despair but he did not give up and that's what I think um, is most impressive. You know, and he said over and over that we, we can never lose hope and if you look at, at his even though he did say that you know, his, his sermon was going to be, America may go to hell. He <laughs> didn't say America will go to hell. And, and, and in those last months um, before he was assassinated, he was planning the biggest campaign of his career. He was planning really a make or break kind of a move. And he had said that it was no longer enough to fight for civil rights. It was no longer enough to focus on voter registration. He had conversations with his advisors who told him, this is a big mistake. You're going to blow up everything you've built. And he said, and we, have the, we know this because we have the transcripts from the FBI wiretaps. He said, don't you want, you can almost hear him, you know, we only have the transcripts, you can't hear his voice, but it almost seems like he's pleading with them. Don't you understand me? Haven't you been listening to me all these years? Don't you know who I am? This is what I believe in. So I am not going to stick to what's convenient. I'm not going to stick to what makes me popular. I'm going to lead a campaign to reform American society. We're going to assemble thousands of people to basically occupy Washington. We are going to move into a shanty town. He called it the Poor People's Campaign. And we were going to, for we were going to force the government to confront issues of poverty, inequality, materialism, and militarism. Until we remake the very fabric of this country, I am not going to rest. So some people felt like he was getting depressed, some people felt like he was running out of gas, but the people closest to him said no, he was, he was deeply saddened, but he was never going to stop fighting, he was never going to lose hope. That the end of that quote that started, they said to one another, behold the streamer cometh, is let us slay him and we shall see what will become of his dreams. So after spending six years and a lot of time with this man, the Reverend Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. and seeing him as a human being, but yet as, as you say, a founding father, what is your takeaway and what do you do next? <laughs> I'm just gonna keep talking about Dr. King as long <laughs> as I can because it's a tough act to follow. But you know, my takeaway, and I have to say, some of my takeaway comes from rooms like this because when you spend six years alone writing a book, you pour your heart and soul into it. You come to know and love the, the, the person you're writing about. Sometimes you come to know and hate the person you're writing about. But in this case, I came to know and love more than I ever imagined possible. And I would have dreams about King. I'm still having dreams about King, literally, not figuratively. But I think the to me, the, the most fulfilling part of this has been just in the last two months since the book came out, um, engaging with audiences. The response to the book has been unbelievably warm and loving, and I didn't know if that was gonna be the case. I didn't know if people were gonna be angry that I was talking about this hero's flaws, this saint's weaknesses, and it's had the opposite effect. Um, I think, and you'll tell me, for those of you in the audience who've read the book already, 
I think the people who've read the book and have, have felt like knowing that he was human, knowing that he was flawed, has made him more approachable, made him seem more real and more inspiring because we can't expect to be heroes. We can't expect to act. We can't expect to fulfill what the Bible or what the Constitution commands us to do as citizens if we have to be perfect because none of us are. And to me, the response to the book um, that, I, that has been the most gratifying is that people have not only seen King's flaws, but they've, they've, their opinion of him has grown um, in light of, of his flaws because he had to overcome, and we all have to overcome something. Is he more dangerous as a human being than he is as a symbol? Yes, I hope so. Um, a big part of why I wanted to write this book is to give him his teeth back. Mm -hmm. You know, we declawed him, we defanged him when we made him a national holiday. And we've watered down his message. You go to the monument in Washington and you have these very safe quotes on the wall and there are none of his books for sale in the gift shop. None. And I wanted to write a book that would give King his, some of his, 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 his bite back. Mm -hmm. When you hear people continually, particularly conservatives, use that content of the character quote, I always say when I hear people say that, I think they, that's the only quote they know. <laughs> um, do you, what, are you, what are your thoughts when that happens? You, you said something about it being a code? Yeah, it, it's a code. It's, it's like, I'm going to use the black man's words to say the most racist thing I can. <laughs> and I'm good. I'm covered. Um, <laughs> We've been hearing it a lot lately in arguments against affirmative action, and uh, you can look and get hundreds of his quotes that show that he would be very much for reparative uh, justice. Um, I also wonder, you know, sometimes when I say to educated people, even in Charlotte, you know, I live in a house in a neighborhood that had restricted covenants in the deeds here in Charlotte that my parents couldn't have lived in, and they're surprised. And I'm saying, well, you're educated. You would know about the Fair Housing Act and all of these things. Do you fear that people don't realize, as you said, his sister just died. He could be alive today. Uh, he was a young man with young children who was killed. That all of this was not that long ago. And that all of the things he fought for and that were fought for in the civil rights movement we're inching and getting rights that people didn't have and that it's still a struggle. Do you think that sense of struggle has been lost because people think it was way, way long ago and he's just a statue? Yeah, you know, this is one of the real perils of teaching history. And we see it not just with the civil rights movement, you see it with the Holocaust, you see it with you know, World, World War II. We tell the stories in a way that are engage meant to be engaging, that celebrate our heroes but in a way that kind of allows us to escape from the, the truths and from our failures and from the complexity of it. And when you turn the stories into, myth, into myths, into Hollywood legends, you lose out on the ability to empathize and you, 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 you know, and, and I'm not just saying this because I write books about history and I'm you know, advertising for myself a little bit here, but it's the truth and this is what the museum does and this is what journalists do. When we confront history in its complexity, we confront ourselves. When we stick to the simple Hollywood version of the stories, we let ourselves off the hook. And when we let ourselves off the hook, bad things happen. Mm. One thing also I was struck with in the book is that you talk not just to the famous people, but ordinary people. Like the girl who skipped school and got on a train and went with their friend to the march on Washington because she couldn't miss it. Uh, Tell me about how you find the, found those folks. Um, thanks, that's a great, I'm so glad you asked me that. Um, <laughs> I love doing interviews. I love the fact that I'm writing a book where there are people who are affected by this. And I must have interviewed 25 people who went to the March on Washington. And then I realized I'm not gonna be able to use any of that because it's the most important moment of King's career and it's about King and you have to you know, write about what he said that day and about visiting the White House and I'm just not gonna be able to get any of that in. And then I started writing the chapter, and I realized it didn't sound that good. You know, it's, it's very hard to compete with Martin Luther King uh, as a speaker when you, all you have is little tiny black dots on a, on a white page. 
And no matter how good a writer, I'm not that good a writer, I couldn't come close to matching the sound of King's voice. So then I thought, well, maybe I could use some of the other people I interviewed to give a sort of a more of a mosaic about what was going on there that day. And um, I thought, I'm just gonna take like my two best interviews from of all the people who were there that day, and I'm gonna try to weave a little story of, of three characters that day. So one of them is um, Francine Yeager, who's a teenager from Chicago, black girl who gets on the, the train at the last minute, tells her parents, I'm going to Washington, D.C. to hear Martin Luther King speak because it's not enough to watch this on TV. You know, I've been watching the Birmingham protests and, and I need to be involved. I need to do something. And she just gets on the train with her best friend. She's got a change of underwear and two bottles of Pepsi in her backpack. <laughs> and she goes. And then there was a guy, I was watching the, 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 the YouTube video of the March on Washington for the hundredth time, and I just suddenly noticed that when Martin Luther King is speaking, two or three times, this white hand reaches in front of his face and adjusts the microphone, and I thought, that's weird. Who would have the nerve to stick their hand in Martin Luther King's face while he's giving the most important speech in American history? So I googled, white guy standing next to Martin Luther King, <laughs> March on Washington. Pretty brilliant, right? That's like Pulitzer Prize winning <laughs> work right there. Um, and up comes a story from a hometown paper of a guy named Gunny Gundrum, um, who was a park ranger who was assigned to be the last line of security if somebody came at Martin Luther King. And I called Gunny Gundrum and said, what were you doing sticking your hand in front of Dr. King's face? He says, I didn't do that. I was just standing next to him. I said, no, you stuck your hand. He, I, said, I sent him the link to the YouTube video, and he called me back. He said, oh, man. Let me, <laughs> let me think about that, and I'll call you back. Um, and he called me back, and he told me this unbelievable story about how he'd grown up in a town where there were no black people. He'd never met a black, people, black person until he joined the Army. He was a frequent user of the N-word growing up, and um, his, his, his life changed when he joined the military and realized that um, he was stationed down south and saw that black people couldn't go in the same place as white. It's like, wow, I didn't know any of that. Uh, maybe I should have. And then he finds himself standing next to Martin Luther King at the March on Washington and sees the response of the crowd and realizes, this man is important. Everybody needs to hear what he's saying. And I think that microphone might be a little too low. <laughs> and he keeps adjusting it because he's, it's, it's an act of love. He's, he's, he wants Martin Luther King to be heard by the whole world, and I just love that so much. So I weave in the stories of, of Francine and Gunny and Martin Luther King into that chapter, and it's one of the things that, I, as a former newspaper guy, I just love to you know, root a story in a little bit of reality, especially, as I said earlier, my goal for this book is to you know, make King seem more real, and that's what I thought they did. Well, we've heard how King transformed Gunny and Francine. How did King transform you? Uh, I'm supposed to be the objective journalist with no feelings, but um, I was, you know, as, I, as you can tell, I was really deeply moved by the opportunity to meet people who knew King, and, and I was inspired by his faith, and I am somewhat faithful, I'm Jewish, um, I don't go to synagogue as much as my rabbi would like, but I think this made me just believe a lot more in our responsibility to love each other and to, and to act on that love, not just to say it, but to act, because what King did over and over is he stepped forward and took that action when he didn't have to, and I'm, I hope that you know, beyond just writing books that I will continue to you know, walk in his footprints. Still a dream. Yes. Well, I really want to thank you so much and yeah, from hearing all these anecdotes, I, if you don't have the book yet, <laughs> it is a long book and it goes by very quickly. And I know you said you can't compete as a writer. It is a beautifully written book. So I would really love to thank Jonathan Ike for spending time with us and to show, to, for showing us the human, Dr. Martin Luther King Jr., the radical, the man. Thank, thank you. you.